Thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness, and I thank you for your grace and your mercy, and I thank you for your strength, and I thank you for every heart here, Father, that you're just, I just see them wide open, Father, for your love and your revelation and your word today, and thank you. Thank you for your presence, and we just thank you for Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, you know I'm going to share about my mother's death a little bit. Um, two weeks ago today, my mom and dad were going from their winter home to their summer home, and they decided on Interstate 40 they were going to take a nap. So both of them were driving down the road sound asleep. And um, my dad, um, there, he rear-ended a semi-truck. He was exiting off, and the, the truck was exiting into a way station. And I, he must have had crews on, and he hit the back end of the trailer at a very odd angle where the corner of the trailer went through my mother. And so everything was untouched in the car except my mother. And when my dad woke up, he didn't know what happened. He didn't know anything. Um, but he said that he looked over and he said my mother was a gruesome sight and that would be with being hit by a trailer or running into a trailer but the Lord showed me that um, as soon as they hit I mean I even believed before I mean at the impact bam my mother was gone and her body was there and there was no pain I just really believed that and so my dad that's why when I called I asked for prayer for my dad because he does, he did feel guilty and um, all of that. But you know, we're just praying for him and that. And then I felt bad. Um, my sister called me, and I just felt kind of bad when she called me at eight in the morning. I knew something was wrong, just because my my sister is ten years younger than me and has three children, and she homeschools them. And there's no way she would have been on the phone with me. And so I knew right away something was wrong. But the Lord just gave me a peace, and it was something you never want to hear. You know, I, my mother was very, very healthy. My dad is very healthy in their early 80s, and they're on no medication whatsoever. So, but the thing that was kind of interesting, we didn't know this, but when they were leaving for their winter home in October, my sister, one of my youngest sister, my, one of the twins lived closest to my parents. So she, um, she was saying goodbye to them, and the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, Hug your mother like you will never see her again. And, you know, Mary said she started to cry because it was so real, but she couldn't have any idea what was going to happen. So she did what the Holy Spirit said. And then my mom and dad were visiting my brother in Houston because their home is in South Texas, their winter home, and they were closer to him because, you know, I have 12 brothers and sisters. And so he was closest to the younger brother there in Houston. And the whole while that they were there, my mother was telling my daughter-in-law, well, when I'm six feet under... <laughs> you know, when I'm six feet under, and they kept saying, Grandma, quit talking that way. And she would just say strange things like, oh, gosh, it's so nice that we're all in the car together, you know, or we're all going out to dinner together. Isn't this nice? And then she told my sister-in-law, when I go home to be with, no, she said, I'm ready to go whenever the Lord calls me. I'm ready. I'm ready now. She was, she was kind of fed up. And then the night before, um, they went, my, my dad and her went to bed, the morning before, the night before she died, she had a heart-to-heart -heart with my dad that she's never had in all the years of their 55 years of marriage. And, um, and then she said, you know, I want to go before you because you've done everything for me. She never did books. She never did anything, no money. My dad did absolutely everything for her, and she did everything for him that a woman would do. And so she said she wanted to go first. And then the next morning she was gone. But the thing that I want to share today with you is really not, the Lord gave me such a profound revelation in her death. It's not even her death. It was after her death that he gave me this revelation. And my parents were Catholic, and my mother was Catholic for 80 years. And there was no changing that. There was no doing anything with that. She was Catholic, and that's the way she stayed. So I knew when we had to go to the funeral that it was going to be a lot of Catholic stuff. But first I want to thank you for all the cards and all the prayers and all that. I had peace that surpassed all understanding at the funeral. I had so much peace. 
And I did get to share just a little bit at the Catholic funeral. They do it different. It wasn't really like a celebration type thing. You went in there and they um, they had the they had we chose the, my my Catholic brothers and sisters chose this weekend and all the Catholic events. But they let us come up and speak and share about what we thought about our mom or how we felt. And I did get to share, but I won't get into that. But it was good, and thank you for your prayers, because that was another prayer I prayed that I could minister to my family. But so, you know, I knew the weekend was going to be Catholic. And ever since I got born again, I had kind of turned my back on Catholicism in a big way. And I didn't like it, and I didn't agree with almost everything they did or a lot of what they did. But, you know, when I went there, I refused to dishonor Jesus by dishonoring my dad. I refused. I honored my dad with the utmost respect at this Catholic funeral. And, you know, what I'm going to share, we, had, we went to a Catholic Mass. We started with a Catholic Mass. And this really is going to go into exactly what the Lord showed me. But when I went into the church, it was a beautiful church. And see, I had had a criticism toward the Catholic Church ever since I got born again. And I was just plain old rebellious before I got born again. And um, I walked in, and, you know, it was beautiful. It was modest and everything. And then they had a cross on the back of the wall with Jesus on it. And No, I'm going to go back. I walked in, and people were kneeling on little kneelers. I call them kneelers. And they were kneeling on those, and they had their heads bowed. And the Lord said, I mean, I just knew it was the Holy Spirit. He said, what's wrong with this posture? And I said, absolutely nothing. And he goes, that's right. And then I saw the crucifix or the cross on the wall and Jesus was hanging on it. And Jesus said, or the Lord said, what's wrong with the picture of this cross? I said, absolutely nothing. It just reminded me of everything Jesus has done for me. And then I, was, I saw a grand piano, prettier than this one, and microphones hanging from the ceiling, and I thought, I bet we're going to have some awesome worship. Well, they got up and they opened up their hymnal, and they started singing a very familiar song, and the Lord said, you know this song. It was Amazing Grace. And then the Lord spoke and said, you know what, they sing it out of a hymnal, but you sing it from your hymnal, the overhead. And I was like, yes, Lord. I mean, I couldn't say anything. So, you know, I saw this stuff going on, and then the priest began to share scriptures. And the Lord spoke to me ever so gently. And he said, aren't these the same scriptures that you share at the Bible college? And I said, yes, Lord, they are. I mean, he was speaking to me so softly and so gently. And then, um, you know, those scriptures were bringing comfort to my heart at that moment. I mean, they were bringing great comfort to my heart. And then the, the priest got up there, and he started saying, with the utmost confidence, now we need to get rid of these seven deadly sins. And he went on and on, and I was just like, oh my gosh. And I was sitting there grieved. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, no, I'm going back, I'm getting ahead of myself, forgive me for my notes, but I'm going to say, even though I was sitting at my mother's funeral, I sat there observing and judging to make sure they were doing things the full gospel way, even at my own mother's funeral. And then at my mother's wake, they had what they call a wake. They said they prayed the rosary. And I mean, I felt like I was on Mars. I didn't pray the rosary. I didn't do anything with it. I, I just was so grieved in my heart that they were praying these prayers. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Sharon, Catholics, don't have a full revelation, just like charismatics don't have a full revelation. And as I sat there and sat in front of my mother's casket, the Lord showed me how I had judged my mother's faith in Catholicism. While I'm at her funeral, and he did it so gently. He knew I was in 
and shock and grief and all this, and the Lord didn't condemn me at all for judging my mother. He did it with such a spirit of gentleness. And um, so during the funeral, after all of this, I have a supernatural revelation of God's gentleness. I know him as Redeemer. I know him as Savior. I know him as Healer. I know him as Husband. I know him now as Gentle. And he is that, exactly what he says. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is gentleness. He was so gentle with me and, and me judging my mother. And, um, you know, after I got back from the funeral, I didn't want to do anything. I, I just didn't want to pursue anything. And I knew I had to teach today. And I was, I missed you guys. And I haven't been with you for a long time. And I was like, I'm not giving up my teaching schedule just because my mother died. You know, and I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to share. And, and Wayne said, it's my mother and I can cry if I want to. So, uh, you know, but just... Um, so I was thinking, Lord, I'm supposed to be teaching out of the book of James, and I'm supposed to be in chapter 2. But chapter 2, I said, I just can't do it. And I sat on the middle of my floor in my office, and I just gave everything to him. And then he spoke to me, and he said, James 4.11. So if you have your Bible, I know it's a picture day, but we're going to go to James 4.11. <clears throat> So we're still in the book of James, but I'm just going to go where the Holy Spirit wants me to go. I'm in Galatians. <clears throat> James. 4.11. Okay, the Lord, the Lord spoke to me this the morning after I got back from my mother's funeral. I was now back in Colorado. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He said, all those years you spoke evil of your mother's Catholic faith. And you know, again, I see the Lord did it with such gentleness. He was so gentle with me. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother, speaks evil of the law, and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Who are you, another translation says, to judge your neighbor? Who am I to judge my mother's faith because I have the full gospel? I mean, he did it with such gentleness. It, it just blew my mind. And as I was meditating on this verse, I kind of thought of James 2.8. And we talked about this in the love class. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. We, I was not loving my mother. I was not living in this royal law of love by judging her. And, you know, I was, um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go by my notes because the Lord gave me this the morning I came home. And so it's just from his heart. And he gave this to me in front of my mother's casket. The royal law. And so the Lord showed me, he said, Sharon, when you have a judgmental, critical spirit, and that means you're speaking in a way that condemns or judge another's actions or standing before God, he said, you are usurping my authority. Who made you God to judge your mother's heart on her eternal destiny? Amen. We break the law of love when we judge and criticize other people. And it's an attitude of pride to think that we have this full gospel and the Baptist and the Episcopalians and the Catholics and the whatever don't have it. The Lord showed me that that was terribly, terribly wrong and that it's grieving his heart. He's, it's grieving. I know this is such a sobering message after these wonderful pictures, but I just have to show, share what the Lord showed me. And then he said, some people, and that's the key in this morning's talk, some it's not everybody. Some. 
Some Baptists don't have the full revelation that they can have tongues and they can operate in the gifts. But I believe they all should, and we know God wants them to, but they're not there yet. So, but who are we to judge another? And the Catholics don't believe they're saved by grace? Boy, do we believe we're saved by grace. I believe we're saved by grace. But you know what? They're not there yet. And even if they don't get there, they still have faith in God and put their faith in Jesus Christ. And then as the Lord was speaking to me, I couldn't help but wonder. He was about to tell me what charismatics didn't have the full revelation of. So I kind of braced myself in my prayer closet that morning. And he said, Sharon, charismatics do not have a revelation of the fear of the Lord. And I could not help but agree with him. He's God. You know, I was judging my Catholic brothers and sisters for bowing and kneeling and praying to God before they started the Mass. And I don't even know what Mass means. But God was in that Mass. And He was there in the Scriptures. They were bringing me comfort. But for me to do this, the Lord was um, very, very um, grieved. And so the Lord said, for a lack of knowledge, people perish. He said, we don't have the... Oh, it says, no denomination, including us as charismatics, have the full revelation of all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has done for us. If we had the full revelation, we would be in heaven. Amen. And if we had the full revelation, we wouldn't be in judgment and criticism. And he said the revelation... No, I'm going to go by my notes. The Lord revealed to me that I had judged my mother all those years, and didn't even realize it until her death. And he said, Sharon, don't take on guilt because you have learned truths in your mother's death as she has learned truths in her passing into my glory. Because my mother was challenging. She was like a billy goat when it came to her faith. She wouldn't budge. She wouldn't budge and she wouldn't give. And um, she was challenging. And the Lord assured me, he said, I showed her some things when she came into glory. You know, so he dealt with me, and he showed her things in glory that her daughter was believing that were true. My mother was judging me, and God showed her her judgment in heaven, how she was against me and all the so-called born-agains. But um, my mother was honored at her funeral for her faith in God. And as I sat there and listened to people that I had never met, I had never met these people, they were telling everybody the faith that my mom had in God, and it just kind of surprised me. I thought, you know, I thought, here, she's not born again. She's not going to heaven. I had put the gavel down and made this judgment that my mother didn't have eternal life. And uh, the Lord... Um, took me back to our home in Michigan when I was four years old. I mean, he took me back to the big girl bedroom, I call it, because we had seven sisters, and so all the girls were in one room in this particular house, and all the boys were in another. And we had rows of beds, and my mother would just come in, and the Lord showed me, as that woman was speaking of her faith, the Lord showed me a time where my mother sat on my bed and prayed with me. And my mother did that every night. And I judged her faith in Christ because she didn't have the full gospel. And then the Lord told me, you know what, I cry. I mean, I, I taught you one time and I couldn't speak. And I taught anyway. Well, I'm crying and I'm going to teach anyway. But in Mark 11.22, it says, we don't have to turn there, but Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. My mother had faith. The Baptists have faith. The Episcopalians have faith. They have faith in God. And we're judging and criticizing, backbiting and devouring devouring these other denominations that love God. They are the children of God just as much as we are. But in a spirit of gentleness, the Lord showed me all of this. 
Galatians 11. We don't have to turn there. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The just are justified. And what are they justified by? Faith in Christ. You know, faith in God, faith in Jesus. My mom had that. And then the Lord spoke to me in Romans 12, 18, and we don't have to go there, but you can if you want. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. God showed me that I could have lived more peaceably with my mother. He said, if you would have just met her where she was, instead of being on your bandwagon of your full gospel, are you born again? Are you baptized in the Holy Ghost? Are you baptized in water? Are you this? Are you that, Mom? You know, and he said, you could have asked her about the scriptures that they spoke at Mass, instead of just brushing it off that she even mentioned that she went to Mass you could have asked her about the scriptures and you could have on, expounded on them together in a spirit of gentleness. We can still share with our denominational friends and non-believers, but in a spirit of gentleness. Not, I got it all on you, boy. You know, you're just way out there. You know, and the Lord showed me that I was honoring my mother in a lot of ways. I had honored my mother in a lot of ways. But when it came to me and my mom with Catholicism and my, the way I believed in being born again, it was constant. It was constant that we never had a peace there. And um, I was always aloof. I would call my mother. I would send her presents, cards. I would be nice to her. I would honor her. But I always kept, I was aloof. And that means you can just you just distance yourself emotionally or physically. Well, I distance myself emotionally from my mother because every time we got together, um, you know, it was she would she would be coming at me. I wasn't coming at her. She she always came at me. But I still had that underlying judgment that I didn't know I had until I sat before my mother's casket. So um, the Lord showed me. Uh, that by being aloof, I was acting in a spirit of judgment and criticism toward my mother. And then in Colossians 3.15, uh, I don't know where all this is, but above all, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. In Ephesians 4.4.6, the Lord said, There is one body, there is one spirit, there is one Lord, there is one faith, and there is one baptism, one God and one Father, our Father. You know what? Baptists, Episcopalians, Lutherans, whatever it is, we aren't better than them. We have legalisms going on. God is so grieved with the backbiting and the judgment and the criticism that us charismatics are placing on denominations. He's grieved. It's his body, and we're all one. And we are just stinking, rotten pride to think that we are just so much better and we just have that fuller revelation. You know what? We are blessed with a fuller revelation. I believe that. But we don't have to act in an attitude of arrogance and superiority. And in that verse in Colossians 3.16, let the word of God, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. In all wisdom, teaching, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And admonish means to call attention to, to caution or to repute, reprove gently. You know what? I don't agree with the rosary at all. I don't agree with it. And I don't know what it means, but when they were saying it, I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know what to do. And I know my mother had lived that way for 80 years. So, but we can admonish gently that, you know, maybe, and don't, you know, don't give your own opinion. If you're going to minister to a denominational person, I got the revelation which I've had taught this before, take them to their Bible. My mom had a Bible that had books mine don't have. 
but it had the books I do have. And take, take them, go to the scriptures with them in a spirit of gentleness. And if they don't get it, back off. Just let the Lord minister to them. So the Lord told me that um, instead of judging and criticizing other denominations, why don't you pray for them for a spirit of revelation and wisdom and the knowledge in the word? Pray for them to have the illumination that will bring them the freedom. Yes, we want them to pray in tongues. Yes, there's a better way to pray. Yes, Mary is not our Savior. And yes, Mary isn't there. And yes, we don't be canonized saints. We're already, you know, all that stuff that I'm not going to go into. But, um, but just because denominations don't have the full revelation, it doesn't mean that they do not have faith in God. And this backbiting and this judgment is grieving the heart of God. And if we're all that we're supposed to, we think we are, then we need to walk and fulfill the royal law of love. We need to fulfill the royal law of love. Um, you know, my mother was so wounded when I left the Catholic Church. She was so brokenhearted because it was her whole life. We could never, we were never mended. You know, I was nice to her, she was nice to me, but we could never go to spiritual things, ever. And two years ago, she came to my home, and we were talking about being born again, and I was on my bandwagon, you know, Mother, you know, you need to be born again. And, you know, she said, well, you know, and I said, it's in your own Bible. Go get your Bible out of your car, and, and I will go through the scriptures with you and show you. And she said, you know, Sharon, I've read those scriptures all the time in John chapter 3, and I do not understand them. She said, but I have had faith in Jesus Christ since I can remember. And she started to weep. And I felt so bad that I was making my 80-year-old mother weep and cry at my counter. And the Lord said, Sharon, she has a broken heart that only I can heal. And my mother told me, when you left the Catholic Church, you as well died in my heart. It meant everything to her, this Catholic thing. But Jesus showed her the truth on the other side. But from this day forth, I will never judge another denomination as long as I live. And my judgment of people has ceased even more, but I know that's going to be, I mean, I'll have opinions and stuff like that, but I'm going to work that out. But as far as judgments and... You know, about 30 minutes after I got the phone call of my mother's death, um, I was like... Don't know where she is. She didn't know what born again meant. So why would she be in heaven? You know, and the Lord spoke to me at 30 minutes after that call, and he said, Sharon, you did not get a chance to say goodbye, but you're going to have a chance to say hello. Amen. I was shocked. Amen. I was like my religious Catholic priest, loving, confessional, loving, kneeling mother is in heaven. That grieved the heart of the Holy Spirit. It, it grieved him very, very much. You know, and I, the Lord said that I just put down the gavel with the verdict that because she didn't understand my terminology and she didn't understand that particular scripture, that I said she wasn't born again and she didn't have faith in Jesus Christ. So, nothing like going to a funeral to get you on track. And, you know, because I couldn't pinpoint, because my mom couldn't pinpoint the day that she put her faith in Christ, I deemed her not a child of God. <coughs> awful, awful, awful. Who are we to judge another? You know, my mom had faith in God. She gave birth to 12 children. And I bet not one of us here have given birth to 12 children. And not only did she give birth to us, she raised 12 of us. And I was one of them, which was a challenge. She had faith in God. She had faith in Jesus Christ. She raised 12 of us. Seven of us are born again. Um, Ten out of the 12 have college degrees. Twelve out of 12 are a blessing to society. None of us are on drugs. None of us smoke. None of us drink. None of us are in adulterous affairs. 
There was one who had one, but they're still married. I'm not going to say we're perfect. But um, she had faith in God. And so do other Catholics, and so do other Baptists, and so do other Episcopalians. And we need to remember that. So my mom had faith to be married to my dad for 55 years. 55 years next Wednesday. You know, tell me that Jesus isn't in the Catholic Church. My, my mom and dad taught me about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, but I didn't come to know them in the Catholic Church, and that could have been from my rebellion. I'm sure it was. But, you know, I judge my mother's faith, and I did not know this until I got to the funeral, but my mother fell asleep in the car with her Bible on her lap, open. And when the EMTs came to the car, it was totally to the car was totaled, it was destroyed, my mother's body was mangled, we couldn't have an open casket. She had her Bible still on her lap after that violent crash opened. Tell me Jesus didn't love my mother. And the Catholics that we judge and the Baptists and the Episcopalians. The Lord loves other denominations. We, we don't have it all. You know, I don't agree with everything like I said. Of course I don't agree. But you know what? They don't agree with us. They, they probably don't agree with our ball caps and worship and turn backwards. And, you know, that to me is disrespectful in our charismatic movement. And even in the charismatic movement, we're backbiting and devouring each other. I mean, I come in with a Band-Aid and I'm, what are you doing with that Band-Aid on, Sharon? You know, there's some unrealistic criticism and judgment going on in the body of Christ. You want, you want my blood all over you? Let me hug you and give you blood all, you know, I might have gouged my finger because my fingernails are so sharp, even though they're short. Sometimes I cut myself with my own fingernail. You know, you want to see that? I'll put a Band-Aid over it. You know, just... We just need to get past that. But I was praying about this. I had a vision three weeks ago yesterday. I was walking down this hallway in this school, and I had a vision. And there's a, there's a, a rodeo arena south of Colorado Springs called Penrose Arena. And I know it for rodeos and maybe dirt biking. I go there for the dirt bike <coughs> championships because I love those, the dirt bike championships. And... Uh, well, this rodeo grounds, they have a south stand and a north stand. And then in the middle is the big arena with the dirt. Well, the north stands were full of people, and the south stands, stands were empty. And me and the Holy Spirit were in the middle of the arena at the pulpit, in the dirt. There was dirt everywhere because horses are in that arena. And so we were standing at the podium. I was here and he was here. And people started to hurl accusations at me. And they started to throw rotten fruit at me. And all of a sudden, in this vision, I disappeared. And I wondered, where did I go? And the Lord showed me, I hid in Him. He goes, Sharon, you're always hiding in me. That is your refuge, and that has always been your refuge. And then, when this fruit that was meant for me, this rotten fruit and these accusations, came at me, they didn't hit me. They hit the Holy Spirit. And the reason I know that the fruit was rotten because when it hit the Holy Spirit, it just splattered. You know, like a rotten tomato, it just splattered. There was no firmness to this fruit. And the Lord showed me that, um, oh gosh, let me go to my notes. Um, He was taking these accusations and getting this rotten fruit, and he stood right here, and he didn't move. He didn't move. He didn't do this or dodge or duck. He stood right there, and he stood tall and strong and took those accusations and took that rotten fruit, but he was grieved. He was so grieved that people were hurling accusations at me and throwing rotten fruit at me. And then he said, the reason 
that the fruit was rotten is because when you walk in judgment and criticism, you have rotten fruit. There's nothing good about judgment and criticism. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And God showed me that I, am do, I was doing the same thing by speaking evil of my mother and judging her Catholic faith. And every time we judge a denomination, we are throwing rotten fruit at them. And it's grieving the Holy Spirit. And I really believe that it starts with us. This judgment and the criticism has to stop with us. And then it needs to stop in this school. And then it needs to stop or stop outside as much as we can do, as much as depends on us to live peaceably with all men. The Lord wants us to do that. So the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not rotten. It's life-giving. And those are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. So in the people that were sitting in the stands, the Lord showed me, are like judges. A judge is in a seated position. He sits. And he's not doing anything. And that was that same thing we saw in James in the doer of the word. One who's usually doing isn't really going to be judging all the time. Even though doers do judge. Believe me, because I'm a doer and I was judging my mother's faith. So, um, you know, when we get up out of the stand, the Lord showed me when the people get up out of those stands, out of that arena, he said they're literally getting out of a judgmental seated position. They're getting out of the seat of a judge. And um, he said when we, um, aren't, when we don't go into the arena and work, we're literally pounding our gavel like a judge against everything and anybody, everything anybody's saying. I remember one time Pastor Ted said, you know, I'll bet Paul was having a scribe write his epistles and he was just, you know, having a transcriber. And then I, sh I showed my husband and I went right, one of the scriptures, one of the chapters, and I go, nope, it says right here, Paul wrote it by his own hand. You know? Yeah, I know he did, but you know what? Can't, I mean, why do I have to be so judgmental and critical? My days of judging and criticism are over from my mother's death. And I, I don't feel guilty, and I don't even feel guilty that I didn't have a good relationship with my mother. We tried. My sisters tried. My mother was in 80 years of Catholicism, and Jesus said, only I can heal her broken heart. So I am free of all that guilt. I don't have any guilt whatsoever. But you know, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And... Um, I want to tell you this, the Lord has been with me, his manifest presence has been with me since the day I got the call from my mother. He's right here. He hasn't left. I mean, he's, I know he's in us now. See, I'm going to get my terminology right for all of us. I know he's in us, but he has been physically with me and has not left me. And he's right here now. And he's with me everywhere I go. And the other night, I was sound asleep Monday uh, a night, I was sound asleep, and at 1:58, it was like, <laughs> and I just woke up, and I was like, I was just like, come in, because it's usually my daughter. She's the only one who's ever come to our bedroom since we've been married, and nobody came in. And the Lord spoke to me instantly, and I knew it was Him. He was at the door knocking, and He said, He quoted uh, Revelation 3:20, "Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and whoever." opens the door, or hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and he into me and we will dine. Well, now the Lord showed me that for a personal reason, that after my mother's death, he is knocking at my door and we are going to dine together in a way we've never dined. I've never lost my mother. I've never lost anybody close to me. And the Lord is taking me away with him to dine. And so we are going to dine. But one thing that he showed me the next morning um, and it's in James 5.9. James 5.9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Jesus Christ is the judge of people's hearts, not us. 
And I know some of you are going into the South, well, the Carolinas and stuff, and there's going to be denominations. And I just really had you on my heart while I was studying this, that you are going to be transformed by this, whoever's going to denominational type ministry. Because we have got to have that spirit of gentleness. We have got to have that. But the Lord um, is standing at the door. He, behold, the judge is standing at the door. And I don't have, I'm going to go to Hebrews real quick. The Lord showed me this. I was, uh, you know, I was thinking about how the Lord has been chastening me, basically, but it doesn't even feel like I'm getting a spanking. I mean, he's doing it so loving, so absolutely loving. Um, I'm just going to read it, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Now, we don't want to hear this in charismatic circles. <laughs> Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, and Peter was rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. I'm a son. We're sons. And what, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? We've chastened our children. But if in its correction, if you are without chastening, of which you have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection this was totally rhema and blew my mind yesterday morning in subjection to the Father of spirits and live. God is the Father of my mother's spirit. God is the Father of the spirit, not us to judge. We are not to judge. It is none of our business. We're judging homosexuals. We're judging... Um, we're judging a lot of things that are none of our business. And yes, we need to correct those in error. And yes, we need to guide and lead. But we do that in a spirit of gentleness. And then there is time for correction when someone's rebellious or there's different things. But I'm talking about judging the motive of someone's eternal destiny or their faith and their relationship with God is none of our business. We are not the judge. And then in Romans 14, 12, So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Romans 14, 12. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Each one of us has to give our own account. You know what? I have a lot that I'm going to go before the Lord with. I don't need to be judging what my mom wasn't doing or was doing. She is with the Lord in glory, and God loved her. He loved her all those years. He saw her broken heart and her tears, how we left the Catholic Church, how we demeaned the Catholic Church, how we dis disrespected our parents from time to time and not um, loving and edifying them in the way they believed in God. So... Then the Lord just is so awesome. He puts a topper on it. I was, Tuesday, I went into a clothing store because I had saw an outfit I liked before I went to her funeral. And I thought, well, I'll go see if it's still there. But it was so expensive. I thought, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm gonna, you know, I just really like these cute clothes. And I went in there thinking, well, you know, it might not be there and then I won't have to worry about spending the money. And I went in and there was a girl on the phone talking about her braces and I'm waiting for somebody to help me and she's the only one in the store and then as soon as she hung up I asked her a question she goes oh I'm sorry did you need help and I said yes and then we talked and I wanted her to find this particular blouse and they didn't have it I said can you find it you know go all over the country and look for it that's what if they don't have it I always ask them to go all over the country looking for it and she did found she found it and she said well you know we give um, discounts and everything maybe you could give me your, your email and then we could um, send you discounts. 
And I said, oh, sure. So I give her my email, which is Lily Thorne. And she said, is that a flower? I could just see her wheels clicking. And I go, well, it's not really a flower. And I described what the Lily Thorne meant. And she goes, oh, so I'm a thorn in your butt, huh? And I said, no. I was telling her how the Lord showed me that I'm a lily among unbelievers and this and that. And she goes, well, you know what? I would love it if somebody would show the scriptures to me. And I said, that would be wonderful. I said, she, you know, and we talked, and she goes, well, I'm Catholic. And that's the end of my message. She's Catholic. And you know what? She was so hungry for God, but I have a revelation of gentleness. I have that revelation. It's, I am free it took my mother's death, but the Lord is good. He's good. And, oh, the girls, there was two girls, then one girl. I'm talking about the Bible, and the other girl is coming. And they, they didn't know each other's spiritual beliefs. They were employees there, and they were behind the counter, and I was on this side of the counter. And they were sitting there talking, and one's now crying, and, and the other one, I told them all about what I did, everything bad, everything I did bad, and they thought they were bad. And she goes, well, the Catholic girl goes, well, I have a Bible, but every time I open it, it goes, <laughs> you know. And I thought, you are so sweet. But see, I would have not had that. I would have had a little different attitude a couple weeks ago. But so the other girl comes, and she starts talking. And they both wanted a Bible study. They both want a Bible study. And so the girls then, so I said, well, you know what? Let me pray for you. And you know what I did? I prayed for them. They were here. I stood here, and I prayed for them. And I prayed as they read their Bible that they would have incredible revelation about faith in Jesus Christ. And that is my prayer for anybody who doesn't understand, that they will have a revelation, just like we need a revelation. We don't understand it all. But And then, after I was done, the girls were sobbing. They were sobbing. And they go, oh, we feel something. We feel something. I said, it's the Holy Spirit of the living God. And those two women hugged each other, and they were employees. And they didn't even know each other's denomination. And they go, oh, well, I didn't know you were Catholic, and oh, I didn't know you were this. And so they got together. Now the girls said they wanted a mixed Bible study. I know I only have a, a one more minute, but will you let me go over just a few, three minutes? Um, they, uh, they want, I said, do you want a ladies Bible study or do you want a mixed Bible study? And they said they wanted a mixed Bible study. And I said, well, I'm at a Bible college and I know that a lot of, there's a lot of students there and I will ask who has a mixed Bible study. So if any of you have a mixed Bible study, I would like you to talk to me if you would like these girls in your group. If not, I'm going to start a Bible study. But that is a revelation that did not come from man, nor was I taught it, but it came by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to pray over us that we repent. We need to repent in our heart. Oh, and then I'm going to just one more last thing. In Hebrews, as I was reading that chastening, I thought to myself, I just thought of that scripture. I just thought that, and that's where I thought I would go to read. The Lord has one on me every time. And, Revel and then the yesterday morning I was just reading. As when the alarm went off, I just took my Bible off my, my nightstand, and I was reading in an, I, Revelation. Nineteen? No, three. Revelation 3. Right, it says, as many as I love, I rebuke and ch chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. So the Lord was saying, no, Sharon, you didn't just go to that and find it yourself. He confirmed it. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And I really believe the Lord wants us. I've already repented. The Lord's already dealt with me for the last two weeks. But I believe that he wants you personally to repent of your judgment and your criticism wherever that affects you in your life. 
So I'm just going to pray, and you can take it with you, or it's a personal thing between you and the Lord. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you. Gosh, I got through that, Lord. Father, I love these students. They are really the apple of my eye. Father, I love them with all of my heart. And I just thank you that today you're going to show them a spirit of wisdom and revelation and what it is you want them to do. I know you want them to repent, Father, and that's not just to confess it and say, oh, I'm that or this, but to turn their back on judgment, to turn their back on criticism, and to love and edify, Father, wherever they go. So I thank you for your precious Holy Spirit and your spirit of gentleness. And I love you, we love you, and we give you praise for being such an awesome God. Jesus, in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're loved, and I love you. And thank you for everything. (laughs)